Hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you for being here this evening, joining us virtually as Princeton Library presents author Elaine Weiss speaking on her book, The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote. My name is Hannah Schmiedel, and I'm the library's public humanities coordinator. Uh, obviously, since we're not able to be in the building, uh, we're doing this uh, virtually on Crowdcast. Uh, a few things to note about this in case you haven't been on Crowdcast before. Um, the chat feature that you see on the right side of your screen will be disabled for the program. But if you'd like to ask questions for Elaine, please use the ask a question feature that's at the bottom of the screen. You can just click on it and it will open up a window for you to type into. Uh, at any point during the conversation, you can submit questions there. And you can also see if other people have submitted questions. You might have a similar one and you can upvote them so that they kind of come to the top of the queue. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be the one to read um, some of those questions for Elaine to answer uh, for the Q&A portion. Um, you'll also see that there's a, um, uh, excuse me, a, a green button below the video. Uh, it's a link to Labyrinth Books to purchase the book. Um, they are our very wonderful um, and frequent partner as an independent bookstore in Princeton. And uh, we all know it's a hard time for a lot of different businesses, including local bookstores. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to follow that link um, to Labyrinth to be able to purchase the book. And they're also offering um, a 10% discount. So our author this evening, as I said, is Elaine Weiss. Uh, she's an award-winning journalist and writer. Uh, her magazine, Future Writing, has been recognized with prizes from the Society of Professional Journalists, and her byline has appeared in The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times, The Boston Globe, The Philadelphia Inquirer, as well as reports and documentaries for the National Public Radio and Voices of America. She's also a frequent correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. Her first book, Fruits of Victory, The Woman's Land Army and the Great War, was excerpted in Smithsonian Magazine online and featured on C-SPAN and public radio stations nationwide. Uh, she holds a graduate degree from the Medill School of Journalism of Northwestern University. And she's also worked as a Washington correspondent, congressional aide and speechwriter, magazine editor, and university journalism instructor. She lives in Maryland, um, where she's joining us from now with her husband, who is a professor of astrophysics at Johns Hopkins. And while not working at her desk or participating in video chat with us, uh, she is paddling her kayak on the Chesapeake Peak Bay, and she'd like to note that she votes in every election. So let's bring Elaine up onto the screen here, and then we will um, hear from her and follow up with the Q&A. Hello. Um, I, I hope I'm, I, you can hear me. Hi, I'm Elaine Weiss. Um, I'm in my dining room in Baltimore, Maryland, and wish I was able to be with you in Princeton, um, a, a town I know pretty well, and um, I would have loved to be with you. But we can do this through the magic of virtual um, uh, telepathy, I guess. And I'd like to talk to you tonight about my book, but more generally about the 19th Amendment, because that's what we will be celebrating um, this year. I, I hope we will be able to, to do it in, um, in person later on in the, in the season. But this is the 100th anniversary, as you probably know, of women's right to vote in America. And it's a, an important milestone, and I want to explain why it's worth knowing about, why it's worth celebrating. And um, I wrote a book about it, uh, as you probably realize, but it's also something, it's a topic that's extremely timely right now, because it's about democracy, and it's about our sense of being Americans in a democratic nation. And I think that's something that's um, under discussion right now. So um, I also am delighted to be talking to New Jersey audience because New Jersey plays a really fascinating role in the whole drama of women's suffrage. And um, I think you will, you can now see a, um, 
uh, a button, a campaign button for New Jersey women who were advocating for uh, women in the state to have the right to vote. This is in a 1915 uh, referendum. And I hate to tell you, but at that time, New Jersey men said no. They did not want women having the vote. And the story I'm going to tell you is how that changed, how it changed for women in New Jersey and how it changed for women across the nation. It's a story really about how American women's demand for the vote, which was once considered radical, crazy, subversive, impossible, slowly and methodically was transformed into constitutional law. It's really the story of the 19th Amendment, the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history, giving the vote to more than half of the citizens of our country, who were not, as you realize, included when the founding fathers constructed their government supposedly by and for the people. So it's really about how change is made in a democracy and in society. The 19th Amendment wasn't just a legal change. It wasn't even just a constitutional change. It wasn't just an election law change. It really, it, did, it really was a cultural shift. It marked a, a societal change in the role and the rights of women. And that's what made it so controversial. The fight for women's suffrage is one of the defining civil rights struggles in our nation's history. And it's one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who has a voice? Who gets to participate? When we say we the people, do we really mean everyone? And of course, we're still asking those kinds of questions today. If you read the standard histories, of American um, society in the textbooks. Uh, and I hope this will change uh, very soon, but it's still true that if you look, you'll only get a very brief and fuzzy idea of how American women won the vote. And that active verb, won, is very important because we were not given the vote. We were not granted the vote. We had to fight for it bitterly and over a very long time. And so that what it usually says is in 1848, American women demanded the vote at the Seneca Falls Convention. And then in 1920, they were given the vote. And there seems to be nothing explained in between. Um, it's required, it, it's sort of um, given as uh, the March of Progress, Natural Evolution, American Men Saw the Light. No, that's not how it happened. It required three generations of fearless activists working over seven decades to win the right to vote for American women. And the culmination of that entire crusade, what we call the suffrage movement, came down to one fierce six-week battle in Nashville, Tennessee, in the summer of 1920. In the summer of 1920, one last state was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, giving all women in every state the right to vote for the first time. 35 states had ratified. 36 or three quarters of the 48 states in the union were required for full ratification. And it turned out that Tennessee might be that 36th state. If the Tennessee legislature approved the amendment, it would become the law of the land. And 27 million women would be eligible to vote in the 1920 presidential elections and the national elections. If the amendment fails, however, 10 could be that the amendment would have been delayed 
for an indefinite period and perhaps not enacted at all. And it's something the suffragists really feared. And those of us who have lived through the vicissitudes of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was introduced soon afterwards in 1923, know that an amendment can come very close to ratification and not make it over the finish line. And so the suffragists really feared that if they couldn't take advantage of the momentum which had um, they had um, worked up, uh, that they might not get see the amendment ratified in their lifetime. And I think it was not um, a frivolous concern of theirs. So if the Tennessee legislature approved the amendment, it would become the law of the land. And the enfranchisement of half of the citizens of the nation was at stake, and it all came down to Tennessee. Now, by 1920, the suffragists had been fighting for the vote for 72 years. Since the first outrageous, it was considered outrageous demand for the vote was made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Meeting in 1848. Now, I have to tell you that most of the participants in that meeting at Seneca Falls really thought that Stanton's resolution asking for the vote was a terrible idea. They considered it too radical, too preposterous, and they really were ready to vote it down. They even asked Elizabeth Stanton to remove it from the agenda. But there was a young man in the audience in the Wesley Chapel, and he had ridden his buggy 50 miles from his home in Rochester to attend the meeting. And he stood up and it was a young Frederick Douglass, just 30 years old, just 10 years out of slavery. And he stood up and he said, no, you must demand the vote. It will not be given to you and it will not be given to me unless we demand it. And he convinced the other very reluctant participants at the meeting to approve Elizabeth Stanton's resolution number nine, demanding the vote for American women. Now, Frederick Douglass is really one of the heroes of this story. He called himself a woman's rights man, um, and he truly was. He believed in universal suffrage. He believed in the rights of all American citizens to vote, and he attended almost every women's suffrage and women's rights convention for the rest of his life, uh, for another 50 years. And he worked with the suffragists uh, before the Civil War and then after the Civil War, because uh, many of the suffragists that we know uh, as the foremothers of the, of the movement, Stanton, Susan Anthony, Lucy Stone, uh, Lucretia Mott were abolition workers before they were suffrage workers. So they had worked with Frederick Douglass. They knew each other. Um, they were on the same team until there was a heartbreaking uh, split uh, after the Civil War when the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote only to black men and not to black women and not to white women. And they, the suffragists had believed that when the war was over that there would be universal suffrage, which is what um, Frederick Douglass wanted too. But they were told the nation couldn't handle two big reforms at once. It couldn't tolerate having both uh, the formerly enslaved black men and women uh, voting at the same time. And so the right to vote for women the woman's hour, as it was called, was going to have to be delayed. And this uh, fomented a split both in the suffrage movement and with, um, with regard to um, the 15th Amendment. And Stanton and Anthony actually worked against ratification. They did not support it because it did not uh, include women. And Sojourner Truth was very upset by this decision too. Um, saying that she was oppressed uh, 
doubly by this decision. Um, race would become a um, very difficult matter in the suffrage movement from then on. And it would be used by the suffragists um, in a way that is makes us uncomfortable and should make us uncomfortable today. But it was used also by the anti-suffragists who really weaponize the idea of race and use it to advocate against the federal amendment. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go on. Now, in the years following Seneca Falls, tens of thousands of suffragists had waged over 900 state, local, and national campaigns to win the vote. They traveled hundreds of thousands of miles to do as Susan Anthony described it, organize, educate, and agitate in tiny towns and big cities across the nation. And we see them begin in horse and buggy, and by the end of the movement, they are campaigning in automobiles. They had to change hearts and minds um, about women's role in society before they could change the law. And so they had to travel all across the nation. It was really a stupendous feat of organization without any of the travel or communication tools that we take for granted today. Uh, there was no passenger rail, passenger railroad travel was uh, really in its infancy. There was no transcontinental uh, uh, railroad yet. There was no typewriter. The telegraph had just been invented. There's no tele, uh, there was no telephone, at least at the beginning of the movement. And even in 1920, where my book takes place, the radio is not in use. And as one young woman in my publishing house uh, read the early manuscript and came into my editor's office and said, wow, I don't know how these women did it, how they organized without Facebook. But of course, they managed. They held meetings and they held rallies and they marched, which was not considered proper for women to do. Women were not supposed to express themselves on the streets. And they didn't wear pink pussy hats, but they did wear their marching uniforms, white dresses with yellow sashes. And so when you see um, women in the Congress for the State of the Union wearing white, uh, when you see um, uh, Hillary Clinton accept the presidential nomination wearing white, that's in honor of the suffragists. And here's some lovely pictures of suffragists marching. This is actually in my town of Baltimore. This is in New York. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, it's hard to imagine how difficult, how brave a woman had to be to stand up publicly for political equality. Um, it was hard to get up and march. You know, today we just say, oh yeah, I think I'll attend that march. It was had many more ramifications uh, at that time. <coughs> Again, it was, uh, the suffragists were thick skinned. You had to be because they were, they had to endure contempt and ridicule in their communities, in their churches, in their clubs, even often in their own families. They were pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables, attacked by mobs of angry men and boys. In fact, Susan Anthony used to say she could tell the progress, she could mark the progress of the movement by the projectiles that were thrown at her. And when they were no longer rotten eggs, but just plain old eggs, well, that was progress. And they were denounced as radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, of course, even Bolsheviks. And here we're gonna look at some rather strong images of anti-suffrage images that we used to um, advocate against women being able to vote. 
Again, these first ones are all about silencing women. Peace at last. Again, strong, ugly, um, all about women should not have a voice. And here again, a binary choice is uh, presented. Do you prefer? Now this is uh, again directed to men who are going to vote in uh, a uh, state referendum. Um, and there were dozens of these. And there was, of course, famously one in New Jersey. We'll talk about that. But um, this was presented to the men of America. Uh, which do you prefer? The home or the street corner for women? Do you want your wife to be home with your baby? Or do you want her as a crazy zealot on the street advocating for votes for women? That was the choice. Here's another one, election day, and mom is going to sail out the door um, and leaving dad with the screaming babies. This becomes a motif that dad is going to have to take care of the screaming babies. The roles in the household are going to change if women have a sense of equality, political and perhaps social. And uh, this is going to be a problem. Here's another one. When women vote, mom is reading the sporting news and smoking cigars, while dad is again holding the screaming baby and having to knit his own trousers from her discarded skirts. This is really going to uh, uh, mess up the, uh, the uh, man of the house's sense of self. Suffragists were also de derided as unattractive, unsexed. Um, they were, why would a woman, an attractive woman ever want or need the vote? She should have a man who will vote for her. And the men who supported suffrage, and there were quite a few wonderful champions, were belittled by the aunties as Mabels and Nancys. Um, guess which one is supposedly the suffragist here? Again, they're, they're shown as being mannish and not very attractive. And again, it's clear what the anti-suffragists were playing upon, fears that um, the idea of women's equality would emasculate American men and um, defeminize American women. Clearly, they were frightening. Here's one of my favorite anti-suffrage cartoons, and um, I think this is self-explanatory. Now, in their quest for equal suffrage, the suffragists were um, <clears throat> had to employ a wide variety of stratagems and methods, and many of these uh, marches and demonstrations and picketing and acts of civil disobedience would later be adopted by the civil rights campaigns of the 20th and even the 21st century. So they are pioneered in the suffrage movement and then they're used by um, succeeding uh, civil rights uh, campaigns. The suffragists were ingenious and fearless. They had to be. To test the prohibitions against women voting, Susan Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and about 150 other women actually voted in the 1872 presidential election. And Susan Anthony was soon arrested, put on trial, and convicted of illegal voting in a federal election. And here's a contemporary magazine that shows Susan Anthony usurping Uncle Sam's hat. It is um, captioned, The Woman Who Dared. And um, she was convicted. She was made, she wanted to go to prison, but the judge did not want a noisy martyr in prison. And so he imposed a fine. She refused to pay the fine. And she went around the uh, New York State where she was um, being, <laughs> being tried and gave lectures with the title, Is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? 
And of course, we're still asking that question again today. So the failure of this voting experiment led Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Stanton to draft a constitutional amendment that would supersede all the state laws that prohibited women from voting. It was introduced into Congress in 1878, and it was stalled there for 40 years. Meanwhile, the suffragists worked to change state law because the states are actually in charge of voting requirements uh, for their residents. And so they tried, while they were working in Congress, to have a federal uh, amendment, a federal suffrage amendment. They also worked in the states to change laws there. So here, or there, where you are in New Jersey, um, suffragists began working very, very early. And as you probably know, New Jersey women could vote when uh, New Jersey first became a state, when it first entered the Union. The original New Jersey Constitution actually gave all adult citizens the right to vote. It even used the pronouns he and she. But that right, and here is this lovely picture, a little engraving of women voting, um, but that right was withdrawn in 1807, and it took more than a century to gain it back. So New Jersey has this distinction of actually allowing women to vote for the first several years and then taking it away. In 1867, uh, Lucy Stone, one of the uh, foremothers of the movement, who was at that time living in Orange, New Jersey, actually refused to pay her property taxes, claiming taxation without representation, and she was fined. And New Jersey women kept trying to bring up the topic of suffrage and kept trying to raise awareness of the importance of it. And here are some women, uh, again, this is in the uh, 19 teens and they are uh, suffrage parade. This is one in Vineland, New Jersey, won first prize in the parade. Here's another one, um, suffrage marchers going through Newark on their way to Washington. Okay, this is in 1913. Uh, here's a group of New Jersey suffrage women. And finally, in 1915, suffrage lobbyists were able to convince the New Jersey legislature to allow a referendum on women's suffrage. Let, let the men of New Jersey decide because only men could vote in these referendums. And so they mounted a tremendous campaign to try to convince New Jersey men. Here are some of the uh, campaign materials. Men of New Jersey, women vote in the 12 Western states, and that was true. In the Western states, um, those states allowed women to vote. And that was one of the things that the Eastern states used as a model. And so why not here? Um, here's one where the Women's Political Union of New Jersey sent out pledge forms to men saying, will you vote? I will vote for equal suffrage. And you uh, were held to this. I don't know what the penalty was, but uh, if you didn't, but uh, it was your word of honor. Again, this, the New Jersey campaign was part of a multi-state effort to break the resistance of Eastern states towards women voting. Western states, uh, many of them had it, as you saw from that map, but not in the East. And for the most part, not yet. A uh, few Midwestern states, actually Illinois did have it at this time. But, so this was sort of a Super Tuesday, a little Super Tuesday, for women's suffrage. There were campaigns simultaneously in New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. And the New Jersey campaign had some um, active uh, workers. Here you see a woman up on a pole, on a ladder, putting up a uh, 
assigned uh, for a, a meeting, and this is in Atlantic City. Here's another um, broadside, a poster for a meeting in Cape May. Here's a wonderful picture of a uh, Votes for Women campaign uh, office on the boardwalk. And I think this is my favorite, the suffrage torch, which was passed between New York and New Jersey. And here you see the suffragists on a tugboat in the Hudson, and they're going to pass the suffrage torch from New York to New Jersey. And here you see this great picture of Mrs. Louisine Havemeyer, a um, rather a wealthy New York suffragist, and she is passing it over to her colleagues in New Jersey. Now, once it got to New Jersey, um, it was carried through the state. Uh, and it was, there were rallies and marches wherever it went. It was sort of like the Olympic torch. And it was a, a way to both celebrate and get uh, publicity and get people out to support and at least learn more about the referendum. But a week after the torch arrived, it was actually stolen from the backseat of a suffrage campaign automobile. The suffragists offered rewards for its return, but so did the anti-suffragists. They wanted to get hold of it, the symbol of the campaign, and I don't know what they wanted to do with it, but they wanted it. Finally, it was found and returned to the suffragists. And even the former New Jersey governor and Princeton um, resident, Woodrow Wilson, now in the White House, famously voted for women, the women's suffrage referendum in New Jersey. Now, lest you think he was a supporter of women's suffrage, he had um, opposed it up, up until this time. He voted for it partly because he knew it was going down to defeat. So it was an easy thing to do. And also he was making the point that he supported it on the state level, that each state should make that decision on their own, states' rights, um, but he did not support a federal amendment, which would give it to all women. So it was a sort of safety move, and he he tried to get a little uh, publicity about it, but it was it wasn't terribly meaningful. Though it was one step on his evolution to actually eventually support the federal amendment. Now I hate to tell you, but even though this campaign literature begged the men of New Jersey to be just. New Jersey men rejected the idea of New Jersey women voting. 300,000 men voted in the referendum and almost 60% said no. Now by this time, frustration was really building um, at the slow pace in Congress the uh, rejection of the amendment at the state level so many times. And a young New Jersey woman, Alice Paul from Laurel, New Jersey, uh, came back from training with the suffragists in Great Britain. And she came home to the US in 1912 to shake up the suffrage movement. And she was impatient with this idea that suffrage was going to move slowly through Congress and slowly through the states. She represented this third generation of suffragists and they were, they were tired of asking. They were tired of being polite. They were willing to be disruptive. And they indeed were uh, willing to even break the law. And so her National Women's Party did things that had never been done before. They picketed the White House. And there they're asking President Wilson, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Hundreds of Women's Party suffragists were arrested and served time in prison for their civil disobedience. They were held in decrepit, vermin-infested cells. 
They were physically assaulted, clubbed, tied to the wall, not allowed to read or write or even speak. When they refused to eat, they were force fed. Tubes rammed down their noses. When they released, they toured the country in copies of their prison uniform on what was called the prison special. And they would have rallies and meetings and parades wherever they went and say, we are your daughters, your mothers, even your grandmothers. Um, and we have been arrested and tortured for asking for the right to vote. And this began to shake people up and put more pressure on Congress to finally uh, pass the 19th Amendment, which finally was done in June of 1919, and uh, then went to the states for ratification. Now, I'll tell you that um, New Jersey was rather slow to ratify the 19th Amendment, and it squeaked by. It did not get overwhelming support in the legislature. Finally, it was the 29th of 36 states to ratify in February of 1920. So it's quite late. Uh, shows that it was there was still ambivalence here. Now, a year later, from the time it goes out to the states in the summer of 1920, the amendment was on the cusp of victory with 35 states already uh, in the victory column or possibly defeat because everyone understood that Tennessee was a dangerous place to be staging this final battle for suffrage. Nearly all the other Southern states had already rejected the amendment and all using the same rationales, states' rights, and they did not want black women to be able to vote. So the suffragists knew that they faced an uphill battle in Tennessee, but they had no choice. This was their last best hope. And so all the forces for and against women's suffrage gather in Nashville. The campaign generals arrive. Oh, here, here is actually the ratification um, uh, document from the uh, Senate of New Jersey in February of 1920. The campaign generals arrive in Tennessee. Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the great a uh, strategist, um, one of the most famous women in the world at this time, comes down from headquarters in New York to lead the campaign in Nashville for, for ratification. She's joined there by representative of the Women's Party, Sue Shelton White, that third generation of impatient suffragist. And she leads this more aggressive wing of the party. So here we have two women's suffrage organizations with the same goal of ratification, working separately, uh, but uh, with two headquarters in the same hotel. And then arriving that same night, uh, Josephine Pearson, the president of the Tennessee Women Opposed to Women's Suffrage, the anti-suffragists, and she promised her mother she would defend her home state against the feminist peril if it arrived there. And they're joined by more than a thousand women and men from across the state and across the nation. There were powerful forces working against suffrage in Tennessee. Political, corporate, and ideological foes, all with their own reasons for opposing the vote. But the most passionate foes of the 19th Amendment turned out to be women. That women might oppose their own enfranchisement was really shocking to me when I first encountered it in my research. But you, we have to understand that many of these anti-suffragists were social and religious and cultural conservatives who feared that suffrage would bring about a profound and unhealthy shift in gender roles. They felt it would endanger the American home and bring about what they call the moral collapse of the nation. It would alter private life as well as public life. And that's what made it so controversial. Uh, and I think this is an important reminder that the debate over women's suffrage was never just 
a political argument. It was also a social and a cultural, and for some, a moral argument about the role and the rights of women in America. And it's a precursor to what we now call the culture wars. And here's, again, a favorite uh, anti-suffrage broadside of mine. It shows, uh, it's called America When Feminized, and it shows a hen and a rooster. The rooster, uh, pardon me, the hen is wearing a votes for women sash. She has just walked off the nest and the rooster calls after her and says, Ma, the eggs are gonna get cold. And she calls back and says, sit on them yourself, old man. My country calls me. And one of the taglines uh, in the text says, a vote for the, for the federal suffrage amendment is a vote for organized, female, nagging, forever. So there, I think it would be a great bumper sticker. So now, all sides confront one another in Nashville, and it gets wild. There's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail, conspiracies and kidnappings and fistfights. The newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon, and the outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment. And I won't spoil it for you, but it does come down to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the legislature who receives a letter from his mother. Now, all this took place almost a century ago, but I think you'll find that the woman's hour and the whole story I tell rings with surprising and even unnerving modern themes. It helps explain where we've been, but also where we are today. It deals with topics which dominate our headlines right now. Voting rights and voter suppression, women's rights, inequality, dark money in politics, the role of religion in public policy, and racism. Because the history of suffrage in America is inevitably a story about race. In Nashville, there are cries of white supremacy and states' rights. The Ku Klux Klan is invoked as a dog whistle, and the Confederate flag is waved in defiance. And of course, we've been hearing echoes of that in our news lately. Now, I wrote this book before the 2016 presidential election. Um, and it has, in those years since, taken on layers of meaning I could not have anticipated. I think there are important lessons to be learned from the fight for women's suffrage. That social change is slow and political change is hard. That the struggle to expand our democracy is ongoing. It was not accomplished in 1920 and it's not secure now. While the 19th Amendment gave the vote to all women, black women and men, Asian women and Native Americans would have to wait decades longer to secure their voting rights. I hope the story I tell will teach a new generation of activists that protest is patriotic and necessary, but it must be followed up by well-designed and sustained political strategies. The suffragists didn't just march and picket, they also debated and lobbied and drafted uh, legislation and campaigned. And they did not rest after the 19th Amendment entered the Constitution. Carrie Chapman Catt founded the League of Women Voters, which is celebrating its 100th birthday this year, too. And Alice Paul drafted the next step in women's rights, the Equal Rights Amendment, which again was introduced into Congress in 1923. It has still not been fully ratified and enacted. The vote is a prayer, as Carrie Kett described it. The vote is power. And today our responsibility is to protect that vote for all citizens. We cannot and we should not attempt uh, to ac accept attempts to restrict or suppress voting. Voting rights is not a partisan issue. It's the stress test of the health of our democracy. And we are 
too often failing that test. I believe that when we think of the suffragists, the best way to commemorate their persistence, their creativity, their belief in democracy is to make sure today that every eligible citizen is able to vote. Thank you very much. And I'm eager to take some questions. And we're back. Well, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, Let me just bring up some questions here. Um, all right. So in terms of the Equal Rights Amendment, which, which you mentioned just mm -hmm. towards the end here, uh, one of the participants asks why you think it hasn't been ratified yet. <laughs> well, um, that's probably um, that's a, a really interesting and complicated uh, question. Um, on the one hand, some of it is the same reasons why it took so long for suffrage to be uh, to be enacted. Um, but I should explain also that the Equal Rights Amendment was not universally um, applauded or supported even by the women who had been suffragists. Um, so it was controversial from the beginning. It's, I think it's in some ways less controversial now, but there was um, a fear in 1923 that it might um, endanger some protective legislations in industries, particularly, that um, women in the progressive movement and suffragists had worked for a long time to enact that protected women in the workplace, like not having to lift um, loads that were uh, heavier than, I don't know, 25 pounds or something like that. So there, there was um, protective legislations that had been hard won and they feared that the Equal Rights Amendment might endanger them. Whether they would have and not legally, I'm, I, I cannot answer. But it means that women who were involved in the labor movement did not support it. Um, Carrie Catt did not support it. I think there's, part of that is uh, her animosity towards uh, Alice Paul. Um, but Eleanor Roosevelt never supported it. So it was not something that was universally seen as uh, uh, the most important thing for women at the time. But I think as we have evolved and some of these uh, issues have been put into statute, you know, improvements, uh, protections, legal protections, financial uh, protections. But as Justice Ginsburg has said, statutes can be changed. Statutes can be taken away. And so the only way to secure some of the gains that we have, we take for granted today, um, uh, women's ability to sign her own uh, credit card, you know, that was only gained in the 1970s. So I think the Equal Rights Amendment is seen now as uh, an important tool in, in making sure that we don't slip back. Um, but again, um, I, th I think there's actually a TV series going on now, I haven't seen it, uh, that talks about the rise of Phyllis Schlafly, um, who actually, if you read the afterword of my book, comes out of the anti-suffrage organization model. It's really interesting. There is a, a clear maternal line between the anti-suffragists and, um, and Phyllis Schlafly and, and the uh, Eagle Forum. So it's a very interesting question. It's complicated. I certainly support the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, as you know, uh, Virginia did ratify um, in January. That's the 38th and, and the last state needed. But there was a deadline that Congress imposed. It's going to go into the federal courts, and we'll have to wait to see how, what, how it works out. So. All right. Um, and then looking a little bit back towards the history, um, could you talk a little bit about why the Western states were ahead of the Eastern states in voting mm -hmm. for women's suffrage? Yeah, it's such a fascinating story. Um, Wyoming, as we know, is is the first in that it 
Uh, it allows women to vote when it's still a territory, beginning in 1869, when it becomes a territory. Now, some of this, to be honest, there, there is the sense of the pioneer spirit and women working alongside men to, to build communities in the West. And, and that is very true. But it's also true that they needed women. There were about six women in Wyoming in, in 1869. And so it's used as a marketing tool. Come to Wyoming and you'll have the vote. Huh. So, so there's part of that. It's very interesting that Utah is one of the first uh, states to allow women to vote. And that has to do actually with uh, Mormonism and, and um, their uh, eagerness to join the union and polygamy. And it, it's fascinating, but it is true that the Western states were just more progressive about this. Um, and the, the um, California votes in after many failed referendums, finally in uh, I believe it's 1911, does give women the vote. Uh, Washington and Oregon, uh, again, multiple times, they had to try several times. It wasn't universally accepted, um, but they are the early states. All right. Um, in the research that you did, uh, was there anything that particularly surprised you, a, a tidbit or a cartoon that really shocked or surprised you? There's so many interesting images that all seem to be vaguely shocking, but was there something that really stuck out for you? Well, there are lots of things that, that shocked me. Um, uh, again, the idea that women were organized against women's suffrage. I, I think I hadn't kind of anticipated that. I, I, you, you rarely read about it, actually. Uh, you rarely realize. Um, but one part of that in the research was I found that one of my heroines, Eleanor Roosevelt, was actually never a supporter of women's suffrage. Yes, it's shocking <laughs> whenever I say this, an audience would go, no, no. And um, so she's not an anti-suffragist. She doesn't work actively against it. But she's, at this time in 1920, uh, you know, 1915, 1920, she's a young mother of like five children. She's insecure. She comes out of a milieu that's... Um, where you know basically uncle teddy's in the white house why do you need to vote you can just tell him what you want um so, but there there was um you know there was a, a very strong anti-suffragism in new jersey too and tended to be wealthy women not completely but it did tend to be wealthy women who were very satisfied with the status quo and their husbands and brothers and, and fathers were the titans of industry, were in the Congress, were in the state legislature. They, they felt, you know, I, I can, I can uh, express my opinions that way. And so Eleanor Roosevelt comes out of that milieu and she is very ambivalent. She never supports the movement. In fact, in 1918, when New York women do win the vote through a referendum there, um, she refuses to vote. She does not vote in that first election where women in New York are allowed to vote. Now, what you see is a very fast turnaround. As soon as the 19th Amendment is ratified, she joins the League of Women Voters, becomes a protege of Carrie Chapman Kett, who sees her potential and taps her to be um, one of the, the leaders of the organization and you see her political career really blossom. But that was a little shocking to me. Um, and then I think uh, we'll sort of finish up on the question of uh, what influence these suffrage efforts have had on other movements since then, and then if there are any sort of lessons that you would draw for women's or other minority sort of equal participation today. Wow, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I think, as I, as I mentioned to you uh, in the talk, that a lot of the stratagems um, that were developed by the suffragists, and, and not just the picketing, which was, I mean, that was not, had not been done before, but the idea of using um, test cases to the Supreme Court uh, was something the suffragists did. And that, again, not the first to do it, but, but they, they do do it. And that is used. Um, the idea of civil disobedience uh, is then taken up by, by 
civil rights campaigns uh, later on. And so while it's not usually acknowledged that the suffragists actually pioneered these, they really, really did. I think one thing um, that we have to recognize is that the suffragists weren't perfect. They didn't do everything correctly or right. They were doing sort of what they uh, could manage uh, in each campaign. And sometimes that meant uh, leaving their black sisters behind. And that's something that I think we need to both uh, recognize and confront and understand what uh, the, the reality that they face too. Um, but understand this as a, a, an experience that you don't get to um, practice politics in a, in a perfect uh, ecosystem. And uh, on the other hand, no civil rights group can afford to leave behind um, their brothers and sisters. And so we need to understand and do that better. Uh, and I think part of the centennial is understanding uh, exactly how that happened and uh, try to rectify it. It also teaches us that we shouldn't expect women to work perfectly together. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there, there is, there are splits in the suffrage movement. Um, and certainly by the end, the Alice Paul and per Carrie Cat are not working harmoniously together and their, their followers are not working well together. But, um, you know, is it, is it, if this was a men's uh, political organization, they'd say that there was a difference of opinion and, and strategy and tactics. And here, you know, often it's depicted as a cat fight. So we have to realize that women are not going to agree on how to achieve uh, certain goals, even if they share the goals. And also that women will disagree, as we see with the anti-suffragists. Um, and maybe we are not being realistic when we expect women to think in a monolithic way. So I think that's a, a valuable historical perspective. It may be a little painful, but it is, it is valuable. All right. Well, um, I would like to thank you again. We'd all be giving you a round of applause if we were there in person. We really appreciate uh, your presentation. And uh, I have started the book. I look forward to finishing it. Um, and I'll remind people, again, there's the green button just down below if you'd like to purchase the book from Labyrinth. And if you want to see upcoming uh, Princeton Library events, you can visit our homepage for things that are coming up. So again, thank you so much, Elaine, for being here with us this evening. and. Uh, Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.